Father God, we thank you so much for this week that we've had together with these children, and thank you so much for the parents that allowed them to come, and we're thankful for the opportunity that we had to, to share the love of Christ with them, and, and as they learn things, I pray that they would remember the things that they've learned, they would hide the truth of your word in their heart, that you would change their lives, and that they would keep their eyes on you. Father, as we open up your word this morning, as we open and look at the scriptures, I pray that we would be able to see who we really are and who you really are and what you want from us. We're thankful that you have declared your will to us. And we're thankful for the opportunities that we have to come together as a body of believers in a community of faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. For those of you that are just joining us, we are in a message series with a, with a theme verse, and we, we work to memorize these verses together. Um, so I'm going to put it up on the screen and just read it with me. It's Micah, uh, excuse me, Hosea chapter 14 and verse 9. Uh, Hosea 14 and verse 9. Read it with me. Let whoever is wise understand these things, and whoever is insightful recognize them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So we are in a, a series on the, the minor prophets. And the, the minor prophets are the, what we would say, they, they wrote the least amount of material in the Old Testament. But they have major lessons to teach us. We looked at previously the mess of Obadiah, and we learned that we needed to humble ourselves before God. And then we looked at the message of Jonah last week, and we talked about how, how the need to be full of, of grace and truth. And this morning, we're going to consider the message of Micah. And when I was listening uh, to the children's song this morning as they were singing, I think this, this message goes right along with that. So I think it's, it's quite amazing. Open your Bible, if you have it this morning, to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. And if you don't have a copy of the scriptures with you, the verses will be on the screens uh, to, my, to my right and left so that you can follow along. The verse that we're going to look at this morning is actually enshrined in the main reading room in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Here's a, here's a picture of that. I think we have a picture of that. We can put up that picture. Yeah, it's right there. It's right, right there in the Library of Congress. This, vote has been, this verse has been quoted on, on numerous occasions. It was the, the German theologian Gerhard von Rad, which, man, what an awesome name. Could you imagine that? Um, Hi, what's your name? And he's like, von Rad. And he's like, oh, that's just, that's just awesome. Anyway, he said this. He said, this is the quintessence of the commands as the prophets understood them. The biblical scholar J.M.P. Smith he called this verse the finest summary of the content of practical religion that can be found in the Old Testament. The American author Lawrence Bolt, he observed this. He said, the rabbis who commented on this verse in the early centuries of the Christian era called it the one-line summary of the whole law. And so here it is. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. As I was studying the verse this week, I, I ran across a, a translation of the Bible that I rarely use. It's the NIRV, the New International Reader's Version. I rarely use this, but what I found is that this version is probably the most accurate translation of this verse in the modern vernacular. Look how it rendered it in, in this translation. Micah 6, 8, it says, The Lord has shown you what is good. He has told you what he requires of you, to treat people fairly. You must love others faithfully, and you must be very careful to live the way your God wants you to. Pastors love these verses because they outline so easily. I mean, it's like three points in a poem. How can you mess this up, you know? The text is straightforward. God, God's not hiding what he wants. He's told us what he wants, and, and what he wants has never changed. He wants three basic things from his people. The first, treat people fairly. Treat people fairly. To treat people fairly, you must have a standard that never changes. To treat people fairly, you must be consistent in your dealings with others. In other words, it's wrong to treat one person by one set of standards and then treat another person by another set of standards. We, we call this hypocrisy. We call this having a double standard. And we feel this tension because we hate it 
when the rich and the powerful, uh, they get away with things. Uh, when the rich and powerful are caught drinking and driving, uh, they, they get let go. Um, when someone of lesser means is caught drinking and driving, well, the next time you see them, they're driving around a moped. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, it just feels wrong. We know this. We, it's a double standard. Everyone should be held to the same standard. If I make financial moves because I have insider knowledge of, of a company, I go to jail. If politicians do it, no big deal, right? And, and we know in our hearts this is wrong. And the examples could go on and on, but I'm sure you get the point. God expects us to treat people fairly. The question is this, by whose standard do we operate? Whose standard do we operate? The original Hebrew, it defined it clearly, it uses the word mispot. Mispot. Uh, it, it means in accordance with the law. That's what it means to treat people fairly. You treat people in accordance with the law. So who is the lawgiver? Well, God is the lawgiver. So we should treat people fairly in accordance with God's law. And God actually summarized his law in two statements. And if you get these, th these two things right, you'll be doing pretty good. Luke chapter 10 and verse 27, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor. It's that simple. It's that straightforward. And yet we make it so hard. Treat people fairly. Treat them in accordance with God's law. The second thing, love others faithfully. Love others faithfully. The emphasis on this concept is not the love. It's on the faithfulness. Faithfulness. It's about loyalty. It's about unwavering commitment. And those of you who have been with us for some time, you've probably heard me use this word before, and you'll recognize this Hebrew word. It's the word hesed. It's the word loyal love. You, you might say it and express this concept this way. You might say, follow through on your commitments. Follow through on your commitments. You said you would do it. And so you're expected to be a person of your word. You should do what you said that you would do. Everyone around you should know that, that you keep your word. Your yes is yes and your no is no. See, God expects us to operate in integrity and faithfulness. He expects us to operate, and, and as he operates in integrity and faithfulness, that's the expectation he has for us. And we actually see this type of commitment in the marital commitment. Karen and I, we, we celebrated our 21st anniversary on, on Thursday. 21 years ago, Karen and I stood before God and each other and everyone who gathered with us, and we committed to what many of you committed if you are a married couple, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for, for poorer, sickness and in health, and you made this commitment. Is it always easy to follow through on that commitment? No. I mean, have you met me? I'm sure I'm not easy, but, but Karen and I, we, we committed to do this. We said, by the grace of God, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be faithful to our commitment. And so this is what this means. This is what it means to, to follow through on your commitments. Be a faithful person. God expects us to love others faithfully, and we love others faithfully by being people of our word. And the third is to have genuine fellowship with God. Have genuine fellowship with God. Live the way God wants you to live. Live according to God's ways. There is a significant temptation to go our own way and to do our own thing. Like Frank, we want to do it our way. Like toddlers, we say, I want my way. And that's how we, we operate. Everything in our culture, it seems to encourage us towards selfishness and self-centeredness. We, we see advertisements that tell us to, to have it our way or, or just do it. It's, it's all about you. What makes you happy? And the marketers, that's what they want you to think. They want you to think about yourself and what makes you happy. But I want you to hear this. And I want you to hear this clearly. All of these factors in our world, in our culture, they cause us to think more of ourselves than what we should. But hear this this morning. Life isn't about you. Life isn't about you. Life isn't about your feelings. Life isn't about your happiness or satisfaction. Life is about your relationship with the Almighty God. 
That's what it's all about. And the evil one will do everything he can to get you to forget this truth. You see, God doesn't want ritualistic relationships. That's not what he wants. He desires a personal relationship with you. And so the word in Hebrew, in this part of the verse, it only occurs here in the Old Testament. And it's the word senua. And it means modest. It means lack of pretentiousness or pride. In most translations, the word is translated humility. But it's more than just humility. It's about carefulness. It's about thoughtfulness. It's about consideration. It's, it's about taking an interest and valuing your relationship with God. Being pretentious is about trying to, to impress others with something of your importance or your talent. That's what it's about being pretentious. You, you want someone to think that you're greater than what you really are at something. It isn't real. It isn't genuine. And, and the internet is full of these ideas. And, and I know all about this because because I'm, I'm an angler. I, I like to fish. And no person who likes to fish wants other people who fish to think that they don't know what they're talking about or what they're doing. And, and their world is full of this. And social medias are full of these ideas. We want to impress others with our knowledge and with what we're doing. But let me let you in on a little secret here. It doesn't work with God. It doesn't work with God. God knows exactly who you are and what you are. You don't impress him. He, he knows your talents and abilities. Bragging about it to God gets you nowhere. Because God wants genuineness. He wants genuineness. God wants you to love others faithfully. He wants you to carry through on your commitments. He wants you to treat people fairly. Be fair in your dealings with others. Let me ask you a question. Do these three traits characterize your life? Do these th three traits characterize your life? Most people today, they, they completely misunderstand what God wants from them. I think many Christians misunderstand what God wants from them. Some people think they can appease God by, by giving money. Others think that, that God wants them to be baptized and, and join a church, and that's just going to get them okay, you know, get the green light when they get to heaven. Maybe, maybe they, can, they can win God's approval by praying before meals or following the golden rule. Maybe God will smile on them if they just dress a certain way and sing particular songs. Ancient people tried all kinds of ways, all kinds of things to try to appease and manipulate and impress God. But you need to hear this, because many people make this error. God cannot be manipulated. God is not impressed with mere performances. God, going through rituals does not earn us favor with God. God does not want a ritualistic relationship. God wants a personal relationship with you. Listen to these words of Christ to the religious people of his day. He said this in Matthew 23, 23. He said, woe to you, scribes, and Pharisees. That's the religious people of his day. That's the people that they knew the scriptures. They were supposed to know. They would have read Micah 6, 8. They should have known. And he says, woe to them. And then he calls them hypocrites. Double standard. Double minded. Two faced. This is what he says. You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin. And yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Those three things that we just talked about. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. If you read Matthew chapter 23, Jesus called the religious people of his day hypocrites many times in that passage. They did all of the rituals and jumped through all the hoops. They, they dotted every I, they crossed every T, but Jesus told them they missed the point. They missed the point of why they were supposed to be doing these things. They missed the reasons for doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be giving of their money and resources to support the kingdom of God's work on, on earth. That, that's what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be praying and they were supposed to be following God's ways, but they missed the main point. They were missing the center of God's expectations because God had told them what is good and what he required from them. 
has told you what is good and what he requires from you. Treat people fairly. Love others faithfully. And have a genuine relationship with God. Some of you have forgotten what God wants. Maybe you haven't even given it much thought. Because there's so many distractions and complications in life. Some of the things that we are distracted by, some of the things that are even good things that get in the way of our relationship with God. Are you concerned with what pleases God? Are, are you more concerned about what makes you comfortable and makes you feel good? See, I don't know if you've realized this or not. Treating people fairly is hard. <laughs> treating people fairly is hard. We talked about last week being full of grace and truth. Treating people fairly requires us to be full of grace and truth. Loving others faithfully is hard. <laughs> some people are hard to love. I don't know if you have any of those people in your life. Now, some people are hard to love. Sometimes we don't even want to follow through on our commitments. Even in our marriages. Many people are willing to completely walk away and abandon their commitments. Having genuine fellowship with God is hard because it, it takes time. It, 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 you're going to have to come to worship. You're going to have to come to Bible study. You're, you're going to have to spend time in prayer. You're going to have to put God first in your life. Your relationship with God is to be your number one priority. These things are hard. They're not easy. It was C.S. Lewis who said this in his book, Mere Christianity. I'm going to read this quote to you. He said, We might think that God wanted simply obedience to a set of rules. We do think that, don't we? Sometimes we think that. We think that God simply wanted obedience to a set of rules. Whereas really what he wants is a particular sort of people. A people of a particular sort. Shall we be a people of a particular sort? The sort of people God wants? That's what I want. And I think that's what you want. I don't want to simply obey one set of rules rather than another. I want to find out what God wants and to be that particular sort of person and part of that particular sort of people. And so the Lord has shown you what is good. He has told you what he requires of you. You must treat people fairly. You must love others faithfully. And you must be very careful to live in the way your God wants you to. Let's be that particular sort of people and part of a community of those particular sort of people. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father God, we realize that we don't always live up to your expectations. You've set the ideals for us. You, you've set the standard that we're to go at. You've told us clearly what it wants. Forgive us for our failings. And show us what needs to change about the way that we live. You empower us to live according to your ways. Thank you for gently guiding us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace with us. We thank you for your examples of faithfulness and justice and love. You are always good. In Jesus' name we pray. Please keep your, your heads bowed during this time of reflection. Brothers and sisters, God has been clear in his expectations for us. How are you doing? How are you doing? Could it be said of you that you treat others fairly? You love others faithfully? That you have genuine fellowship with God? This is a time of self-reflection. If you find yourself not where you should be, this is the opportunity to make some changes and fix it. I'd encourage you to commit to these three ideals. Are we always going to measure up? No, we're going to mess up. But these are the ideals. This is what we're supposed to be striving towards. And when we find ourselves falling short of these ideals, then we, we fix it. We move back to where God wants us to be. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that we worship a God who's told us what he wants. It makes it a lot easier to worship him 
And he said, this is what I want. And remember this, this is about your relationship with God. It's not about religious rituals. I also want to talk to those of you, maybe you're, you're here this morning, joined us online, and, and you're not where you need to be with God. And you know this because you've not taken the first step of obedience. You've not repented of your sin and accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for your sins. Maybe for you, the church has been all about ritual, but you don't have that relationship. It's so necessary. Let me tell you about what Jesus has done for you. We, we talked to the children about this all week because he, he loves you so much. Jesus was born of a virgin and without sin. He didn't have a sin nature and he never did anything to fall short of God's standard of righteousness. That's different than us because we're sinners. And our sin leads us to do ungodly things. It's why we never quite live up to the ideals. It's why we mess up. It's why we do things we're not supposed to do. It's because we have this nature that separates us from God. We have a sin problem. But Jesus went to the cross and he shed his blood. And he did this to pay for your sins. And he died and he rose again. And he did all of this because he loves you and he wants to save you from your sin. He wants to transform you. You can experience his goodness and grace. You can have healing in your life and peace. You must surrender to Jesus. And if, it's that, if that's you this morning, pray with me, Heavenly Father. Forgive me for my sins. Make me clean. I acknowledge Jesus as my Savior and the Lord of my life. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have questions about the message this morning, maybe you'd like to meet me or I'd like to meet you or whatever, just spend some time together talking about what God is doing in your life. I want to give you that opportunity uh, to, to do that. I'll be out in the lobby. I know that everybody will probably be going this direction because that's where the food is, but I'll be in this direction for a little bit out in the lobby to my right, uh, your left, and you can come by, you can talk, and we can, um, we can talk a little bit. I'll be back with the bouncy houses and things as well. As well. So if you want to talk about the message this morning, I'd be more than happy uh, to sit down and talk with you for a little bit. And if that's not for you, you're like, hey, look, I'm not really that type of person. Um, our email address and phone number is on the screen as well. So if you joined us online and you want to talk to us about uh, this morning's message or you have something going on in your life, you can use that email address and phone number to get in contact with us as well. I'm also going to, in just a moment, ask our deacons. Some of them will be at the front of the worship center um, so that if you have needs or you have questions or you need to talk about what it means to follow Christ or, or any of those matters, the deacons will be here in the front of the worship center to, min to minister to you. Also, this is our fifth Sunday benevolence offering. I know maybe you didn't come prepared for that. That's okay. Um, but our deacons will be at the rear of the worship center uh, with plates to collect for a, a, this special offering uh, for benevolence. All the money collected in that will go towards benevolence ministries. Uh, there are envelopes in the chair backs in front of you. Um, I would encourage you to use one of those to write on that. that this is for benevolence and then place that in the plate um, as you uh, leave this morning. And may God bless the gift and the giver. May the peace of Christ be with you all, and let's stand to sing. Before we